This morning comes to us from the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Would you please stand as you're able for the reading? Hear these words from Paul. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Friends, please join me in a spirit of prayer. Our gracious sovereign and our God, assist me to proclaim, to spread to all the world abroad the honors and glories of thy name. Amen. Last night we were driving back in from Dallas down I-45, and we were marking our time by the passing of Bucky's. Does anybody else do that, right? And we were right after that first Bucky's, but before the second one, if you know where I'm talking about. And there, as we were coming down the highway, there on a kind of a rural overpass, it was kind of one of those bridges over I-45 as we were headed south, there were a bunch of first responders from what looked like a volunteer fire department with their American flags there on top of a bridge. So as we went toward under the bridge, they waved and we kind of honked and waved back and we just were reminded of the thanksgiving we have in our hearts for all those who serve on the front line back 20 years ago on 9-11 but also every day. Uh, I I think it must have been something that whole county was doing because in that part of the country there must have been about five or six different bridges where we saw that going on, but it was really touching. And then Laura and I kind of talked a little bit about things we were thankful of, and one of those, of course, is also our armed forces deployed around the world, those protecting our freedoms and liberties and serving in harm's way on our behalf. And I began thinking about them And then I have to confess something. A little bit after that, something kind of weird creeped into my mind. It was a thought that went something like this. Was that 20 years ago? Was that really 20 years ago? And I I asked Laura, I was like, that was a long time ago. She said, yeah, our son John, who we visited, who was now a junior at SMU, he was three months old when that happened. She said, don't you remember? And of course, I remembered the phone call when she called me that morning. Uh, At that time, uh, I was traveling all over the country. I had uh, over 52 car rentals in that year, and I was flying all over the place, setting up computer networks for people. But that week, I was getting to stay in Austin and setting up the class and the network there locally. I was making sure some breakfast items and computers were working and everything was lined out for our customers when Laura had called and she told me that someone had flown a plane into the side of the trade centers, only to go to our break room and turn on the TV and put on the news channel and a few moments later watch that other plane fly in and realize it was no accident. Time slowed down. I can still tell you to this day where I was, what I was doing. I can still remember details, even when last week seems blurry. I can tell you where I was. For other people in this room, that would be when JFK was shot. For another generation, it was when World War II was declared. 
There are other times and other events that people hold on to and remember that when they found out the news of the nation, suddenly everything stopped and changed forever. But national news isn't the only thing that can have this impact. I don't know about you, but in my life, honey, I'm pregnant. That changed a lot, okay? Totally different all of a sudden, everything. It's not always sad news that changes the day. I love you can make everything all different. A good report card, a passing test, someone who you know who struggled for years with an addiction, finally finding their way to get the help they need, those moments in time that just seem to stand still, and we dream and we hope and we punctuate our time by them, that everything's different. And yeah, some can be bad. We go into a doctor's office and we hear that news we don't want to know that reminds us of our mortality. We hear work from an employer telling us what we're not going to be able to do even though we love the job. There are all kinds of things that remind us and boil down to how important every second of a life can be, how important time is. But so much of the time we have, if you will, what I might call harembe syndrome. My little hippopotami that I shared, or hippopotami is plural, but my hippopotamus, right? What I shared about him, so much of our time, friends, the way we live is as if we have all the time in the world, as if nothing can ever somehow impact the myths we've created for ourselves, that our bodies are somehow immortal, our thoughts will live forever, the programs we've put in place will continue in perpetuity, and we forget the frailty of every moment of existence. And the ultimate reality, I mean, not to be, I don't want to be too down, but you know, friends, I kind of realized a long time ago, one day, I'm going to die. The sooner I come to grips with that and realize that, the better off I can make the days I have between now and then. Because there's an urgency to how we as followers of Jesus should live. There's an expectation of how we should make use of our time. It's not to fill it with a bunch of busyness that is just doing things to fill space, but instead an intentionality that realizes the impact and the importance that the moments that God has given us can make in the world around us. And how if we just take a little bit of time to get that right, to reorient our lives and our ways of being to understanding the centrality of the grace of God, we might somehow transform all of our living and all of our days in a way that is a blessing beyond what we can imagine. Now, you know, choir, I I don't know about y'all, but these last oh, I don't know, 10 years for me, as I've kind of had kids from the ages of about 9 to 19, 10 to 20, I've had two titles, right? It's not dad. It's ATM and taxi cab. Is anybody else familiar with being one of those? Grandparents are not immune 
to that work, right? And being busy and running between things and trying to provide and to make things happen. Sometimes I wonder, did we work to give them the wrong things because we tried to give them what we didn't have? Instead of finding the time to put God first in our lives so that they might learn by example how God can transform all the coming and going, all the busyness. I guess this morning, you know, when I read Ephesians and I kind of get into the text and I try to understand the, the trouble I'm trying to get after, what I'm trying to understand from this word, is that very first part that Paul writes in today's text. It's not just anywhere, it's at the middle of this beautiful book. But for the next couple of weeks, we're going to just laser focus in on chapter 4. I hope you'll make a little time and take some time and kind of read the whole book. But at that beginning of chapter 4, at the central part of this book, he says, therefore, since I am a prisoner, I'm a prisoner, go and live a worthy life. Go do all these things. Like, what's up with that? Like, have y'all heard of Paul? Like, in this right side of, of this book over here? Like, he wrote ha over half that part, the New Testament? Like, he's attributed about half the books there. He's a great guy. I mean, he, if he's not follower Jesus number one, he's like one, two, or three. He's pretty awesome. But here he is writing from jail to people. But he's not writing as a person who's upset about being in jail. He's a person who's writing that even while in jail, it is a blessing so that what he is doing might yet convert the Gentile world because he is meeting and getting to know the guards and those who are locking him up. And because his being there means they will be converted. Man, that would change some of my waiting, wouldn't it? How would that do when you had to wait for an appointment with a group of people? If you saw your purpose as a follower of Jesus, to have been so converted by the grace of God that you wouldn't leave the waiting room until you prayed for every person and knew their needs, even if they were the ones locking you up. Wow. This book of Ephesians isn't asking us to add one more thing to our to-do list. It's asking us to reimagine what our life looks like because the grace of God has been made known in the world. It spends those first three chapters building through an understanding of how the grace of God is alive in the world and what God is up to. And then the last four that we're going to read, this chapter four into five and six, seeing what does that mean and then how we live life. When we talk about the time barrier, this idea that we might have things that prevent us from being full followers of Jesus, the thing we tend to put up as an obstacle is our busyness. Well, we're running around and we're doing all these different things, or we think that somehow it's one more thing to do, or one more program, or one more item to add. But what I want to encourage you to consider is how short life is. And what can life look like 
if it's defined by grace. Because this is what Paul writes to us. He writes to us that if we allow ourselves to be transformed by the grace of God, the world around us might also be transformed by that grace. That somehow God is working through people like us to share the grace of God with the world. So I'm going to ask you to do something. You'd, you don't have to email it to me. I'm going to ask you through the years if you ever did it, but you know, there's a bunch of y'all and just one of me, so the odds I'll catch you won't be very high, right? So there's low accountability on this, but I hope you'll take me at my word. I'm going to ask you to do one thing, one thing. I want you to be a hippopotamus for one hour. Can you do that? All right? I want you to take one hour and set it aside for God. Just one hour this week. And to ask God in that one hour of just being, what does your grace mean to me? Now, if you need accountability and you want to email it to me, email it to me. That's great. But it's going to mean something. If you spend an hour praying to God and looking, there's going to be something you need to do. Now, I'm always a little bit careful when I do this because I used to give some specifics. Well, it may need, mean you need to do this and you may need to do that. And one time I was sharing the specifics and I, I think I said this in Bible study, I, I, I told a person, you know, in, in the sermon I was, I was preaching, I, I said, you know, it may mean you need to call that brother or sibling, you know, that you're not reconciled to and reach out and allow the grace of God to do something, right? And at the end of the message I got, but I said, but if you can't even call that brother, at least come to Community Cafe. It was a, a family ministry, and we, need, we were short that week, and, you know, we, we were going to be serving a couple hundred people food, and we needed some help and stuff. And so that next week, this choir member, like one of y'all, was there. Y'all would all be there. I know that. So now I'm not pointing at any of y'all specifically. This choir member from the church where I was serving at the time came down there, and she was there, and I was like, well, what are you doing here? I don't know that I've seen you. This is great, you know, and all that. She said, oh, yeah, this is a lot easier than calling my brother. <laughs> right? But God will put that thing you need on your heart. I don't want to try to list it for you. But how do you need to let grace work in your life? And then write it down and allow God to help you. It's not another thing to do. It's something to be. Because if we are followers of Jesus, allowing God to have our lives is what we need to do. Because here's the myth about time that we have created for ourselves, the delusion we live in, we think it's ours, but all of our time belongs to God. And if we're ever going to move beyond normal and to be the people that God has called us to be, to move past the time barrier, we need to give that time that we have back to God. I hope you'll start with one hour in prayer this week. Amen.